Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the next installment of Perspectives from the Hemp Industry. I am here with uh, Jeff Thomas and Christian Christensen, uh, folks that have been uh, working on a industry university uh, partnership in uh, the Northeast uh, part of Florida and, and just happy to, to have you folks here and, and participate in our, our conversation. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, jump into uh, introductions. Uh, I'll uh, give uh, Jeff the first chance. Uh, let us know who you, you are and, and where you're from. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Jeff Thomas. I'm with Tater Farms and uh, Ancient City Hip is our company that's uh, licensed to grow hemp. I'm a University of Florida graduate, uh, just a recent graduate, no, just kidding, but uh, University of Florida graduate with the experience in mainly greenhouse production, but I've, I've worked with vegetable fuel production and turf production my whole life. So, and uh, Great, thanks. Uh, Christian, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself as well. Sure. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, my name is Christian Christensen. I currently serve as the center director for the Hastings Ag Extension Center. I also serve a role as a regional specialized extension agent uh, for the Tri-County Agricultural Area, which includes Putnam, Flagler, and St. John's County. So formally affiliated with UFI Extension. Great. Thank you. Um, Jeff, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your, your hemp business and, and kind of what brought you to the, to the endeavor? Um, yeah, we started, uh, my gosh, I guess it's about three years ago with all the rumors of, of it being legalized in here in Florida. Um, we initially did a lot of traveling. We traveled up into the Midwest, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, even out West and uh, watching what other people were doing in the country. And we decided to give it a shot. We had some goals that we thought were real important being experienced in agriculture. And that was to figure out how to grow the crop. Um, what varieties would adapt to Florida. Um, we decided to try as many varieties as we could early on. Um, uh, and then it's essentially how to harvest and post-harvest physiology, what was gonna happen. And then finally, where were we gonna sell our product? Um, so our business model uh, starting off was really to, uh, to figure out how to grow, harvest and market and sell the crop. Um, it was, it's a minor crop for our production. We, we've we basically uh, got into it uh, maybe as an alternative crop to figure out if we could make money on it and then to expand it once we found out and answered a lot of those questions. So essentially our business model was to learn and, 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 and learn how to handle the crop, grow it and harvest it, so. Cool. So hemp is a, a lot of things, right? There's a lot of different options to make a hemp business, make a, a hemp crop. Can you be a little bit more specific about kind of what decisions uh, you folks made at, at Ancient sure. City? Um, uh, well, one thing, one thing I knew uh, from our experience here in Florida is we, we decided right off the bat to grow it on plastic. We did experiment on bare ground, which was a total failure. But um, um, so we went out and uh, tried to uh, locate seed from as many different locations as we could and rooted cuttings. Um, again, it, it was part of the, our initial uh, uh, trial of trying to figure out which varieties grow and which would be adaptable to Florida. And uh, so we, we also wanted to find out what the seasonality of it, uh, where, what was it gonna be spring, uh, fall crop, winter crop, um, and so we actually tried it all, and um, and and we think that uh, you can grow it all seasons here in Florida, in our area, anyways. And um, so that that was basically it. Um, we also uh, we've had a lot of experience. Um, we use drip irrigation, um, and we we also use the drip for in injecting our fertilizers and and some of our bios that we put into the soil. Um, and then we would spray with overhead, basically. But all our all our irrigation was through drip. Yeah, crimp, hemp crop all year round. That sounds exciting. Um, maybe I'll uh, swing the conversation over to Christian. Can you talk a little bit about some of those uh, genetics uh, that you were seeing out there and kind of how that might uh, shift throughout the year? Absolutely. And it's a great question. So we trawled uh, 20 different varieties um, with Jeff Thomas and, and Tater Farms and Ancient City Hemp. And um, of those 20, we evaluated six autoflowering genetics, also referred to as day neutral. So again, six autoflower day neutral varieties and then um, 14 photoperiod dependent lines. So really wide 
breath, in terms of genetics, um, in terms of phenotype and how they behaved in the field, what physical attributes um, that they demonstrated. And there was a lot of variations, not just in flowering time, but plant height, total biomass, extractable biomass, and disease incidences. There was a very wide response in, in how a lot of these varieties responded to not just the photo period, but also the presence of disease and other pathogens. Right, and, and so uh, just to say it in a different way, growing through the winter months when there's uh, short uh, light would require the day neutral genetics in, in order to make it through. Is that right? Have you been able to do any of the photo period sensitive uh, varieties over the winter as well? Yeah, we made a huge mistake of trying that without lights. Yes, it, it, <laughs> they get uh, they get uh, 12 inches tall in flower and then with no yield. Right. Uh, so um, anyways, but the uh, the day neutral, the auto flower varieties um, are, are, are definitely uh, viable in, in fall and in spring. And uh, they, they do, I think they do extremely well. And, and there's some good genetics out there and very, very consistent growing crops, basically. So, so you said that you'd been able to see 20. Is there something about uh, freight favorite uh, that you're seeing or you're still rotating genetics uh, through your, your fields? Um, it, it, Christian will have a much, much uh, greater degree of accuracy on this. But my, my experience is that uh, uh, cherry wine was our, our, our best um, uh, variety that, that uh, responds to day length. And, and then Maverick was the best variety of the autoflower, um, hands down, okay. in, in yield and, and, and everything else. So You seeing something similar, uh, Christian, or thinking about others that'll be, uh, I mean, good options based on their morphology or growing characteristics? Yeah, I think, I think Jeff did a great job, kind of nailed it on the head. Um, so with the autoflower and genetics, Maverick is really a top performer. Um, but I do think that there are other varieties too, um, by the same, you know, by the same breeders, the same companies that um, could give Maverick a kind of run for its money, so to speak. Um, yeah. yeah, cool. And uh, of course, uh, we're still in the early days and we've seen 20. Uh, I think the UF list is something north of 50 or 60. Uh, and of course, uh, some of these better, well-established lines are, are also meeting some stability requirements, uh, though there's still a big open question about what does the name really mean and are those genetics consistent uh, across the, uh, the suppliers. So, uh, you know, and just an interesting note to our uh, listeners uh, that we're using some names here, uh, but, uh, you know, it's worth uh, really digging in. Uh, to, to, to that uh, when you go making your choices. Um, okay, cool. So I, I just uh, want to jump into the, to the next question, uh, if I can. Um, and, and Jeff, this is for you. Uh, you know, tell us uh, about, uh, you've had three years now to, to look into this crop. Tell us uh, across that time, what's been the most exciting experience for you? Um, the most exciting experience is, is uh, it, it's, um, it's a new crop and it's, uh, it's been illegal for 80 years. And there's just something that's, I think, really cool about growing this out in the field. Um, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just an exciting crop. It has huge potential if we can work out a lot of these marketing sales and, and growing problems. But um, so that, to me, that was, uh, that was uh, really exciting. Um, it's definitely a very pungent crop when it uh, goes to flowering and you can smell it a mile away. So you, everybody knows you're growing it. So that's another exciting thing. And, um, um, but uh, just, just the, uh, it being new um, and, uh, and you know, it, it's, it's very challenging and, and it brings a lot of interest um, when, when you grow it. Um, a lot of people want, are very interested in it and come and see you and just a lot of hype around it. So that was, that was a lot of the excitement that it generated. So. Uh huh. Um, you you mentioned growing challenges. Maybe the pair of you could uh, kind of uh, detail that a, a little bit. What you mentioned uh, growing it out in the bare ground wasn't something that was working for you. Are there are there other uh, issues that you found uh, putting together this cropping system, or feeling like you you figured it out and are just ready to ready to go. Um, I think we've got a real good handle. Uh, um, and our confidence level is real high on growing the crop here in Florida. Uh, there are a lot of challenges that, that you know, we have experienced from growing other crops here in Florida. 
um, that we kind of knew a little bit about what we were doing when we started. Um, but there's, you know, disease is, is a huge issue. Um, insects are, were really not the, the threat that I thought they were gonna be. Um, uh, but the disease part, when the plant goes to flower, uh, botrytis is just a huge issue and it takes a lot of experience and, and know-how and basically being able to harvest your crop when it's ready. And uh, you, have a, you have a very limited window of when you can harvest and dry. And if you don't, you are gonna lose right. here in Florida. Um, right. And so, um, being, you know, I've, I've come from the vegetable industry and greenhouse industry, and I kind of knew those things already. You have certain windows that you've got to get in there and harvest. So we were prepared for that. And, and uh, it, it, but we were shocked and Christian can testify. And we had some absolutely gorgeous plants that were unbelievable. And uh, the next day they were melted um, <laughs> because they didn't get harvested in time with botrytis, you know. Okay. And, uh, with the right with the right weather conditions and humidity and temperature so um christian what were you seeing uh with the diseases across the the genetics uh everything susceptible or there's some that uh, might also uh, show those sorts of traits no that's that's a great question and there is definitely variation um in disease susceptibility and incidence across not just the auto flowering genetics or day neutral genetics but the photo period uh dependent genetics as well so I think there's huge opportunity there um, for selection of varieties that perform well, um, not just in North Florida, but across the state. But again, just to echo uh, Jeff's comments here, there's we had beautiful varieties out there at that location. Um, and within 24 to 48 hours, uh, botrytis and other diseases just set in and, and reverted the crop to something that was unsalvageable. Was this throughout the year? that you were noticing it or one of the particular parts of the year that uh, botrytis was was most uh, prevalent most most prevalent um i'll uh, and then christian can answer too but it's most prevalent in the fall you know and when you're harvesting under in october in late october when you can have warm nights and or a slightly cooler nights and 100 humidity and moisture present all night long is uh is when you're really really susceptible to it but it, we did see something similar happen in our, in our, our spring crop. And um, so, um, so it can happen in both, but uh, definitely more in the fall is when you really have to watch for it, so. So one of the things that was interesting to me following your work was this idea of a trade-off between productivity and disease resistance. And so I was hearing from you folks that there are a couple of varieties that you're like, yeah, star performer, really dense, really nice uh, flowers that it was putting on. But then those are also the same sort of canopies that held on to the moisture and, and got taken over. So there might be a, a balance there with the, the architecture and, uh, and, and the crop performance overall. Do you want to answer that one, Christian? <laughs> I, I sure I'll, I'll take a stab at that one um I, Zach I think that's a great point I think plant architecture and density of flower buds and, and density of biomass is a huge driver uh towards when you're going to see the disease resistance um just to call out you know cherry wine um is a top performer in the summer fall crop of 2020 um very large plants um dense flowers but one of the benefits I feel of that variety is that you do have a fair amount of airflow throughout that crop. Um, you have kind of a longer internode spacing. So just a more balanced uh, canopy architecture allows for more airflow, so less disease incidents there. Um, you can see, and we did see some disease and botrytis issues in Maverick. Um, obviously, it's a much more squattier, dense, compacted plant. The flowers themselves aren't necessarily dense, but the overall above ground biomass can be dense, and that can drive a lot of disease incidents there as well. Right, even with those dwarfs, you can still have uh, kind of that con condensed uh, inner canopy. So, yeah, something to something to be able to see. Did you uh, you mentioned harvest timing was critical? Did you do anything else to uh, help with the the disease issues in your system? Um, well, we 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 learned that you basically have got to to spray, you know, preventative spray, and you know it's coming, and you just got to get out there and spray two or three times a week. And okay. um, with, with what's labeled that you can use, which isn't much, but it, it does help, you know, the peroxide right. based stuff and, and some of the biologicals. We definitely saw, I, I think, 
it's anecdotal, but I think we saw uh, a real impact on some of the biologicals too. You okay. Know? And um, so. Cool. Um, um, so is there, uh, you know, we, we, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the product production and you getting a handle on that. Uh, of course, we, we're not selling raw hemp material in the grocery store, so you got to get a handle on uh, the supply chain and the, and the business aspect of, of that. Um, is there any special project or, or business goal uh, that you'd like to, to share with the listeners? Um, sure. Um, we, uh, again, with, with our initial goal of trying to understand the crop and learn how to market and sell it, I, I actually took a product. Um, biomass to different labs and different locations and had it processed. Um, and I can, you know, um, I think this might be the next question, but um, one of the things you got to do is you've got to go out and experiment. You've got to meet the people that are out there. You've got to hand them some product and then see what they do with it and see the results because uh, this, this is, a, I think the industry is still the wild west. Everybody's got a, a, a different story and a different way of doing it. And, um, and until they actually produce something, it's, it, I, I, I have a tendency not to believe until I see what happens. And um, so we did, we, we ended up doing distillate and, and oil and, um, and, uh, and, and learned an awful lot about that. And then went out to the market and, and tried to sell it out there and see what would happen and, and looked at the pricing and everything like that. So, all right. How are you feeling about, about the market? Is there a market um, out there for your product? Yeah. Absolutely, there is. It's it. It's. I think there's a a real great potential. We we strongly feel that we've got to be vertically integrated. In other words, we've got to control the product from from table to, to consumer, and and basically that's what we're working on now. Um, and it's uh, after all this, it's it's the only way that we can get a guaranteed price for what we're growing and and have a, a handle on what we're trying to do and what we're trying to sell. And that's that's going to be our model rolling forward in the future. And um, um, and that's what we basically learned, you know, is that it's uh, there's just not this open market for hemp biomass. The, the, it's just uh, it can be two dollars or it can be twenty dollars, you know, and, and uh, it's very difficult to just inexpensive to store dried hemp. And um, and so it's um, it, it's there's just a lot of factors in it. So. Yeah. So, so where are you at uh, with with your hemp business? Uh, full steam ahead. Uh, wait and see. Uh, we're, you know, kind of how's that working out for you in twenty twenty two? Twenty twenty two. We're on. We're we're not. Uh, we're not planting a crop uh, this spring or or summer or fall. Well, we might do it in the fall, but right now, spring and summer is out. Um, we're extremely business in our in our core. Extremely busy in our core business. And, um, and we're working with some, uh, with some other groups trying to basically fig figure out how to vertically integrate is what we're doing. Okay, so. yeah. Uh, and that, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Christian, maybe you can tie that into what we've been seeing in the, the hemp acreage. You have any uh, insight uh, for kind of how 2020 might've been different from 2021 and what we might expect for 2022? Yeah, absolutely. So 2020, we saw, you know, a pretty aggressive space. A lot of people, uh, a lot of growers have gone out and, and procured themselves a hemp cultivation license through FDAX. Um, as you go into the 2021 calendar year, uh, we saw a bit of a decline in those numbers. And I think that those numbers align too with some of the numbers that we're seeing, not in the permitted acres, but of those permitted acres, how much of those acres were successfully harvested. So I think that there was a lot of learning that was happening across the industry, um, all the way from field production, all going into extraction and product placement and development. So um, going into 2022, um, this calendar year, if I could speculate a little bit, um, I think that we may see a, a further decline in you know, high cannabinoid essential oil hemp production acreage, um, both acreage that's permitted and harvested. And uh, speculate a little bit farther, there may even be an increasing interest in more of the grain and fiber side than of the essential oil flower side. Right, hemp's a, hemp's a lot of things. And um, yeah, it's interesting. We see uh, the uh, CBD products or hemp extracts uh, in all the grocery stores and gas stations and, and whatnot, but we don't necessarily have a sense of how quickly those products are moving. Uh, and uh, kind of hearing from the processing side of things, uh, I think lines up with with more of uh, 
what you were saying, Christian, uh, about kind of the upcoming coming year or so. Um, okay, so I didn't mean that to be a leading question. Uh, <laughs> anyways, we'll see how, how it comes out. Um, okay, so so the last one that I have uh, today before I, I let you uh, you know in on your, your parting thoughts, uh, Jeff. First, uh, what would you tell someone considering growing hemp or starting a hemp business? Um, oh, one of the things that I was told many years ago is uh, when you get into agriculture, um, start small and uh, and experiment. Unless you've got a big big checkbook and you want to write and spend a lot of money, but. Uh, uh, really, you've got to, you, in agriculture in Florida, um, it's real, really unique here. And uh, we have really, you know, almost three different climates from a growing standpoint. And every one of them can be severe in, in their own way. And um, so the thing is, is to start small and experiment. Um, there's most people in our industry um, are, uh, are very friendly. You can go and talk to people and ask them what they would do and listen and get ideas and uh, and the and experiment. Um, we all know of people that uh, in the last, especially in 2020 and 2019, that jumped in head first and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, and were completely unsuccessful. And um, and um, so again, advice is is uh, whatever you do in agriculture, start small, and and experiment and, and get a feel before you put real money into it. You know, so. What do you want to add, Christian? I think those are great, great comments. Um, a lot of focus on risk mitigation there. Um, you know, I, I guess I could do a bit of a selfless plug here, but um, for any growers out there interested in, in growing hemp, I think there's a there's a great network of growers um, throughout the state of Florida. And I would encourage new growers or prospective growers to reach out to growers that have experience and also always feel free to reach out to your local extension agent and they could put you in touch with some of the resources that we have in hand to, to help you be successful. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, considering that this is a recently re-domesticated crop, we are all learning um, hand in hand, growers, IFAS Extension and our IFAS researchers, we're just trying to learn best that we can as quick as we can and um, just kind of lean on each other for, for expertise moving forward. Yeah, great. That's exactly what we're here to do today. So, And, uh, and I, I would like to uh, give a plug to both of you and, and Christian especially. Um, um, Christian was a, uh, a big help. I didn't really even know Christian when, when, when we started the hemp and, uh, and he went out of his way to work with us and, and he's got a, just a wealth of knowledge about hemp specifically and, and marijuana. And, um, and, uh, he is, uh, just a wealth of knowledge and very, very easy to work with. And, and, uh, he's a big, big reason for our success. He, he taught me things I had no idea about hemp and, uh, and, and, uh, just, really helped us uh, become successful. And, and I was very open and, and very willing to give his time. So the same with you, Zach, you've, you've headed up this program and, and uh, got it organized in the state of Florida when it was very disorganized. And um, um, so congratulations to both of you. You guys have done a great job, so. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. It was uh, great having you along with the pilot project. And we've certainly uh, learned a lot from the, the partnership. So uh, mutual, uh, uh, appreciation. So, um, is there anything else uh, you fellows would like to to add? Uh, something you want to say to to our listeners? Um, I could say that if um, you know if, if anybody has any questions, um, my contact information will be, and I, I you know I'll be willing to answer any questions. And and if anybody has uh, any comments or anything, be willing to listen too. So. Very good. Yeah, working to start a conversation or or continue it on uh, uh, through through this uh, series. So appreciate that sentiment. Okay. Well, I think that was a, a great conversation for us, and and thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, Thomas, uh, Tater Farms in Ancient City Hemp, uh, Dr. Christian Christensen from uh, the Hastings uh, Agricultural Expen Extension uh, Center, uh, UF IFAS. Uh, appreciate the time today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah.